So we've talked about PBLL, project-based language learning, in general terms and what our overall goals are here. At this point, most teachers are wondering, okay, yeah, but what is it? <laughs> You're telling me what it is, but what is it? What is it? Well, how is it actually work? How is it actually put together? What actually happened? So how PBLLs are structured has to be explained from two different perspectives. We have to explain how they're structured by the teacher's creation and planning. And then we have to explain how they're structured by the student's experience because those are essentially opposite things. Um, although there's flexibility and they interact, they're essentially opposites. So looking at this template is how I hope to provide you with something that is easy to follow and simple, a simple step-by-step -step guide to planning a really high quality project-based language learning unit, which we will call PBLLs for short. As we've discussed, we want to draw inspiration from our students' lives, their needs, their interests, their passions. So you have a step up at the top here where you can start out with inspirations. So this is where you list the things that are most relevant. You, you take your master list of inspirations and ideas and you put together a couple, one or a couple that go together that make a topic. So an example would be my students are really into dinosaurs and they're really into the idea of track anim tracking animal tracks and they're really into the idea of solving mysteries. So I put those together in my inspirations. Those are, those are what I'm drawing on. And then as we discussed, how do, how do we make it into a public product? That's really important. So what is the public product going to be? So in this case, I might say the public product, I'm coming up with this instantly off the top of my head. The public product is going to be that they create a mystery about a dinosaur that has to be solved by solving clues and tracking the dinosaur. So they are actually going to write it. And then the reason that it's public is that their, their colleagues are gonna to try to complete it. So they're gonna give a, a challenge to their colleagues to track this imaginary dinosaur and solve the mystery and find the dinosaur, hunt the dinosaur. So they're creating a dinosaur hunt. And that di dinosaur hunt is the product and the fact that other people are then going to engage in it and the event at which they are going to engage in it, whether that's in person or online, is what makes it public, which is very important. So I think of the inspirations and then I think of the public products. So you notice I just started at the top of the page and I'm just working my way down. When I think of my public product, I need to stop and check that it's a good one. So I have three checks here to help me make sure that I've conceived of a really good public product because everything else is gonna follow from there. We're working our way down the page. Everything else that we do is gonna come from this public product. So the first thing I need to ask myself is, what is the real world connection? What does this have to do with real life? Because if it's just pure imagination, if it's just pure uh, fake activities that we do for school, then it's not gonna feel important. So there's more than one real world connection in the idea that I just made up. One is that they play with their friends. They like to play with their friends. They like to play video games and mystery games where they go on quests and they solve mysteries and they find things. They like imaginary hunting. Some of them go real hunting. So this is relevant to their real life. It has to do with their lived experiences. And from the other side, we can say that this is about um, scientific facts and collecting evidence and um, coming up with a well-supported hypothesis. This is a fun way of approaching um, scientific thinking. And that is obviously connected to the real world. So there's more than one way that we can say that this is real world connected. So that's good because it's going to feel important to the students. If we don't come up with a very strong real world con connection, for example, if we say, well, we're writing a fairy tale. Well, what if I don't like fairy tales? then what does this have for me? So real world connection is a chance to check to make sure I care about this. We can still write fairy tales, but there has to be something about it that is a real world connection. And so that's why you're checking your public product to make sure that this makes sense, that this can have meaning to lots of different students, even if this exact genre or activity isn't their favorite thing, it has meaning for them in the real world. You check that. Then you check about collaboration. It's important that PBLLs be collaborative because otherwise, who are they gonna use the language with? <laughs> they need to have uh, language interactions, right? 
So how are they going to collaborate? And that's also a real world connection because most work in the real world is collaborative work. So you need to think about it. Um, for example, do I want groups of two, two or three to design the challenge, the mystery, and then they challenge other groups? Uh, do I want the whole class to come up with one challenge, one uh, mystery? Do I want um, each individual to come up with uh, their own individual, but they have someone that they check it with? What's the structure? I come up with a structure that makes sense that's going to make this activity really meaningful for my students. And so I make sure that that's integrated into the vision of the public product. And finally, before I move on, I need to make sure that students have control over how this goes. Because again, this topic might not appeal to all my students. This topic might not be everyone's favorite thing. So what, how can they personalize it? How can they make it meaningful for themselves? How are they the leaders here? For example, I said it has to be about dinosaurs. Maybe some people don't like dinosaurs. Could they control the animal or the organism that we are hunting or the mystery that we are solving? Could they have control over that? Would that still work? Or can they have control over who's in their group? Can, do they get to decide who they work with? Or do they get to control what medium the challenge happens in? They can create it online, they can create it in person, they can create it by correspondence. Well, how does it, how it works is up to them. Is that, is that where the choice is? How does the choice, where does the choice come in so that this is their project that they designed? And yes, you gave them some parameters, and yes, you're guiding them toward a, a set of, of topics and, and issues and ideas, but it's theirs. So how are they going to make it theirs? And if you don't have much for this, then it's time to reconsider that public product. How, do, how can it be something that fits into this unit, but is really, truly theirs, and they get to make it meaningful? So all of this is about making sure that the public product is really meaningful to the student. They really care about it because that's just going to carry them through the rest of what we're gonna talk about. Then I give it a title. The title is unimportant. It's just a shorthand for the teacher. It uh, helps with record keeping. Nobody cares what the title is. We super care what the driving question is. This is big. This is essentially where I'm thinking about why are we doing this? Now, I don't have to have known that when I came up with the idea. I just like this idea and I thought the kids would be really into it. It sounds fun. But now is the time for me to think about what's the meaning? What's the deeper meaning? Why is this serious? Why is this valuable? So maybe you don't love this idea, dinosaurs and hunting and games. Those aren't really your things, but this is important. So what's the driving question? And I like to say that this is a non-Googleable question, meaning this is a life question. This is, what am I exploring about life that I don't know the answer to when I'm four and I don't know the answer to when I'm 40, but it's always worth exploring and I'm exploring it through this project. But this requires thought. So here I'm gonna sit and I'm gonna think, well, I'm learning about critical thinking and evidence when I'm solving my mystery, what is good evidence, what is not. And that's pretty important in the real world in lots of ways. And I might also think about our relationship to the, na to the natural worlds. Um, so then I might think about uh, a driving question. There, there could be, a, there's no one right answer here. You come up with it. But when you come up with it, it should really hold meaning for you and it should really guide you. And not only that, but it should be transparent to the students. This should be a student facing question. Um, if you're in a physical classroom, this should probably be huge on the board or huge on a banner across the wall because it's what we are pondering now. If you are online, some equivalent of that, this is what we are pondering. This is what we are chewing on. This is what our little brains are working at for this period. So this is really important. So give it some time, come back to it if you need to. For my idea that I'm making up off the top of my head, I'm going to say, how do critical thinking and evidence collection help us relate to the animal world? help us relate to the animal nations. So that's, there's no, you cannot Google the answer to that question. You cannot say, oh, it's five. Or, oh, uh, it's yellow. No, it's a huge question and it's a lifelong question. What, how do we use science? How do we use evidence of critical thinking 
to have good relationships with the world around us, in this case, the animal world. You can, have, you can pick a different driving question, but it's important. It's important because that's gonna inform everything. So notice that the teacher is moving from the top of the page on down. They're thinking about these things in order because they flow logically from one another. So this is how it's structured for the teacher, the facilitator. At this time, you know what we're gonna be talking about. You know what we're going to be ultimately doing. So it's time for you to pause. If you're in a standards-based classroom, but you might choose to make your classroom standards-based even if it doesn't have to be. And you're going to consider which standards you can cover in this unit. Which standards are you addressing? Because again, you might get some ideas by looking at the standards that help mature what happens later. So based on what you find there, you might say, oh, I could integrate this. Oh yeah, I could integrate that. Oh yeah, I could integrate that. Content standards, we've talked about content. Content is, in this case, probably science, biology. It's also critical thinking, maybe debate, um, writing, uh, rhetoric. Um, those are the areas that everybody learns. They're not just language areas. And I'm aligning myself to the standard. I like to align all my projects to social justice standards as well, because I like to think about everything through a social justice lens. So I use the um, social justice standards, which were developed by the organization that used to be called Teaching Tolerance, and I think its new name is Learning for Justice, I think it's called. So they have developed students, um, social justice standards. So again, I'll look and I'll say, which of these standards will fit into, into this unit? And that will inform some lessons and some ideas that I have going forward. So I do this right now, because it's going to inform what comes below. Actual standards are language standards. You can choose different ones if you have different ones that you use. But basically, I have content, social justice, and language that I integrate into every PBL. So now I know what the public product will be. I know what the driving question is, what's the life meaning of this, and I know what standards I want to cover. Based on all of that, I can now decide what the summative assessment or assessments looks like, meaning what happens at the end, and how am I going to assess them on a rubric and give them feedback on how they did at the end. So this is backwards planning. It's really important. It's, it's top to bottom planning because it's backwards planning. I'm starting with the end, and then I'm going to work backwards from there. So I decide that, a, for, for example, um, if I have a performance, if every individual is going to, to talk, is going to use language during the performance and show their mastery of the information and, and mastery of the language, then I can have just that one, that one performance where we're going to assess them all. But if, for example, it's going to be, um, in this case, I, I give you an example, it's going to be games that people are going to come and play. If, if the people are going to show up to an event, find the game and play it, then the students might not really be demonstrating their language and content knowledge at that time. Uh, because it's really up to the participants to play it. Therefore, I'm going to have a second assessment that comes um, one day before, probably, where in front of the class, they're going to get up and they're going to show us what they made and they're going to explain it in the language. And that is when I'm going to have a chance to capture how well they're doing in the language and how well they, they learned the information, content and language. So I need a moment where I really get a good look at everyone. That might not be the very final public product. It might be, depends on what it is. But if the very final public product doesn't allow me to really truly assess each and every learner, then I have uh, multiple assessments so that I will have a chance to assess everything that they've learned and everything that they can do at the end. So I think of what those will be and I make that plan. Based on what that looks like, I now decide what the skill targets are or the objectives are for the unit. I have content, meaning things they will learn about the world. And I have language, meaning what will they be able to do in the language? And there's a link here to the co communicative competency inventory, which is where I will pull my competencies that we are working toward for that. So I have a list here, content skill targets, language skill targets. This is a list of everything that they will be competent in doing by the time they are done with this unit. Again, this takes a lot of time. You may not complete all of this in one day. This takes time. You'll think about this because you're gonna be picturing those summative assessments. You're gonna be picturing what they're actually doing. You're gonna be asking yourself, if that's what they're gonna do, what kind of language do they need to do that? What kind of language can they demonstrate? What kind of content knowledge are they demonstrating at that time? For example, I said that they're going to create a game, but it's gonna be based on evidence and, um, and solving a mystery. 
And as I pictured them doing that, I realized that this has a lot to do with debate and rhetoric. It has a lot to do with writing skills about how you organize your ideas and the strength of your evidence. So suddenly I realized that those are some of my skill targets. That's what I'm trying to get them to learn. Those are content skill targets. Evaluating evidence, constructing arguments, um, collecting facts, differentiating between facts and, and opinions, for example. Those are my content skill targets. And then my language skill targets are whatever they're gonna be able to communicate and whether it's spoken or written. So I set all of the targets for the unit. So now I know everything that they're gonna do at the end, a good picture of the end. And now it's time to think about the milestones along the way before we get to the end. What formative assessments will I have to do along the way so that they'll be good and ready for that final assessment? Essentially, I take those content skill targets and those language skill targets and I break them down into less complex pieces and I think about an activity we could do to help me assess each of those pieces. For example, the construction of an argument. It's part of the game that they create, but when they're creating the game, it's part of many things that they're doing. So at least one of my formative assessments is going to involve them just constructing an argument. So I can just look at how well they've learned to do that. And of course, if, if I'm going to assess them on that, then I have to have lessons before that, right? So it's all flowing backwards. So now I know what I'm going to need to cover. I'm going to need to spend, oh, at least three days working on constructing arguments or five days working on constructive arguments so that they can do this mini task where they actually construct an argument and I get to assess them so that they can use those skills in the big final assessment. See how the backwards planning is working? And now that you know what they're going to be assessed on and you're starting to think about what the lessons might look like, you can start thinking right away about scaffolding. And there's a note here uh, for you to look at about scaffolding. But it's essentially a time for you to think about which of the skills targets that I just mentioned, which of the activities that I just thought of, are going to be kind of hard for them. And what kind of supports do I want to offer to make it a little more doable? For example, if learning all the scientific names of the dinosaurs is part of what they're going to do for the game, but it's not really my main goal because I really just want to see them work on the evidence and work on the fun part of the game and work on building a story and characters, then I don't really want to spend a lot of time drilling them on the scientific names of the dinosaurs. I think I'd rather just provide them a scaffold where it's just pictures of the dinosaurs with their scientific names. And they can just look at that and pull the names off of that. I don't really need them to do all that memorization, especially because they're only going to be hunting one dinosaur. It doesn't make sense to learn the names of 30 dinosaurs, for example. So I come up with that as a scaffold. That's something that's going to be hard. Here's a tool I'm going to make, uh, to, make it, to make it more doable. And, and so you are basing that on everything that has come before. What am I going to be asking them to do? What are they going to try to do? What about that is going to be hard? and maybe not the focus. And so what scaffoldings am I going to create for them to make that more doable? Because right as soon as you think about what the final assessment is, you're gonna start thinking about your learners who may struggle and what's not doable about it. So you're gonna think of scaffolds that are gonna help them. For example, if I'm asking them to design a mystery, I may provide them the format of how a mystery works and just ask them to fill in the blanks with their mystery. But I may decide that no, the key, one of the key learnings is how mysteries work the components of a mystery. So we're actually gonna learn that. I'm not going to give them a scaffold. They're, we're actually gonna spend multiple lessons learning that so they should know that on their own by that time. Um, or I decide, no, I don't, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on that. I'm just going to give them a, a template and they're gonna fill it in with their mystery. And I'll just say, by the way, that's how mysteries work. It's all up to you. Now that I have a really good picture of what's going to happen throughout this unit, what they're gonna struggle with, what I'm gonna assess them on, I have a really good picture of this unit, as it's going to flow and as it's going to end, now I start thinking about individual lessons that will happen, individual activities. I use the word activities because lesson really implies that, you know, I get up and I tell them this is the lesson today. And some things might work like that and a lot of things might not. So input and activities is just stuff that's gonna happen in the classroom that is going to lead to the goals I just set. I provide you on this template what the first day can look like, how you can introduce the, pro the project. There's another video where I show you an example of that, but this walks you through steps. So you can already prepare this lesson for the first day. But here is a place where you brainstorm other activities. 
you brainstorm, for example, well, well, if we're going to create a mystery game, we better play a mystery game to know what they're like and talk about what's involved. So I would type in here, play a mystery game. And then when I have time, I would come back and I would put in a resource. A resource would be a link to an actual mystery game that I found online, or I found one in person, I just type its name in, for example, Clue. I, I found an old copy of Clue and I'm gonna use that um, in my classroom. So I just write in there the resources for this activity are my Clue game that I have. And then when I'm ready, I start thinking about what language are we going to learn to, during that? When we actually play that game, what language are they gonna to have to say in order to play the game? And what language am I gonna teach them about the structure of mysteries? And so I put in my language chunks. The reason I put in the language chunks that go with that activity is because I'm gonna then look at that column once it's full and think about my sequencing. Which of these makes sense first? Which makes sense next? Which of these is pretty advanced? It's gonna to come toward the end. And I'm gonna partly know that because of the language chunks that are required for each activity. So I'm gonna put them into sequence. And that is going to be my unit plan. That is going to become a calendar. I recommend that you put it out onto a calendar. Um, you can use any calendar program you want or you can just make a table in any Word document or anything and just plan out the days, how they're gonna flow and when those formative assessments are going to happen and when that summative assessment is going to happen. Knowing that that needs to be flexible, knowing that that's going to change with how well the learners do or other new ideas that they may come up with. But it helps you to see how much time I need for this, when is a realistic end goal, and also to think about sequencing. What comes first, what comes second, what comes third, where does this need to go? And you can play with your sequencing on an actual calendar. That's what I recommend. And then once you have the idea of everything that's going to happen, you need to do some planning. So there, here's two parts that you need to plan. One is the community connections that you wanna build. So you always wanna stop and think, okay, given all the activities I came up with, who are the members of the community, especially fluent language speakers, who I can bring in on this. How can I make this go outside of the school walls, outside of the classroom walls, and be something that happens in, in community? For example, are there people in my community who like to lead games? And so they could come in and they could teach us games and we could work on game language with them. Are there just people in my community who would like to play games with us? And we could just throw a little games night as a practice for the big game at the end. Um, if so, who would I reach out to? How would I, how would I build that up? How would I get those connections? Do I have somebody in my community who really likes science? They really like dinosaurs and they know lots of words in the language about dinosaurs and they could come and they could make a little dinosaur presentation. That's a community connection that I build. So I stop and I really think about that and I plan those people and I reach out to those people and I say, hey, in about a week, we're going to be ready to learn a lot about dinosaurs. Could you come in and teach us? Could you make a video for us? something to get outside of that classroom wall. So I build those connections. And then of course, budget. Of all the things that I've dreamed of, I've just been dreaming. Now, what are the costs of the things I've just dreamed of? And can I get those costs? So I make a plan for those. And then there's a very important yellow box at the bottom of this form. And this is where I keep notes as the unit is going on. So I have my unit plan here, which I'm referring back to, and I've probably also made a calendar for myself. As this unit is going on, I'm treating it like an experiment. I always treat every unit I teach like an experiment. And this is a space to remind me to take some notes. Pluses are things that went well. This was awesome, do this again, this was a great idea. Deltas are things that I would not do the same again, I would change. For example, I tried to play Clue with them and they just weren't into it. I just could not get them interested in Clue. They just kept saying it was dumb. They wouldn't engage. So Clue is not something I'm gonna use in the future or something I forgot to do and I wish I would have done. For example, uh, Clue involved a lot of new vocabulary. I forgot to teach that in the previous days. So then when we sat down to start playing Clue, they were really excited, but they didn't know a ton of the words. And I wish that I had front loaded some of those. So that's a delta. That's, those are things I'm gonna do the best. And I tell you what, teaching is so intense that you forget these. So it's really important. I use this really religiously. I fill this out. I actually do this in every lesson, every day. I fill out what went well and what I would change because at the end of my unit or at the end of my course, I will not remember what it was I wanted to change. I think I will remember at the time, but I won't. And so this is basically a to-do list for me at the end, things to consider. 
So I really value keeping this repository of feedback to myself and always evaluating how it's going. And, and especially because it's important not to take that personally. It's, a, it's not a judgment of you as a teacher. It's important to treat this like an experiment. You're trying it out, you're seeing how it's going, you're learning. Next time you'll try it out again, it'll be a little bit better. You'll see how that goes, you'll learn, et cetera. So this is the structure of the template. And so the teacher works from the top to the bottom. The experience for the student, however, happens from the bottom up, right? That based on the budget that you have and the community connections that you have, the student experiences activities. They experience the resources that you bring in and they learn chunks of language. They learn phrases and expressions uh, and they go through all of that. And based on what they learn there, they're able to use scaffolding within those lessons to do formative assessments. You have those mile posts along the way where you are doing formative assessments. So because they've been through some of your lessons, they're able to do their formative assessments. Because they're able to do their formative assessments, they start reaching their skill target. And then at the end, they have their summative assessment, which as we said, may be the same as the public product, but it may not, which is when they are really showing what they have learned and what they have considered about the driving question. Again, there's no right answer. There's no one answer to a driving question, not to a good one anyway. But that's a time where they really show what they've been thinking out about with regard to that driving question. And of course, they end with a public product. And that's the end for the student. They may now love new things. You may now have learned new inspirations and you can note them and then you can carry them over to your next template and you can work through your next unit. You're free to personalize this, but this is the essential structure. And so what I wanna emphasize is that this is the structure that the, that the teacher goes through when you're creating the curriculum. What's my goal? How do I get there? And the learner's experience is, oh, we're doing something fun in, in class. I've been given an introduction to it. I'm excited about it. This is what we're gonna learn how to do. And now I'm going through these activities and I'm getting better and I'm getting better. And then at the end, look, I'm able to do it. And then I get a rubric with feedback from my teacher on how I did and I see my growth. So they experience it the other way. So you plan backwards, they experience forwards, but the structure is the same that we're always working toward this driving question, we're chewing on it, we're processing it through all these different activities, and at the end we are able, using our content skills and our language skills, to create the public product. I hope this is helpful.